Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Um, Alina's very, very, very excited today. Why are you very excited, Alina? I'm very excited because we've got with us Jonathan Clements, who's a historian and author. And he's, by the way, he's written so many books. I was going to list like half a dozen, but then I kind of thought we'll be here all day naming his books. But I'm going to mention just a few. So uh, Confucius, a biography, and um, Admiral Togo, Nelson of the East. But we're actually here to talk about his new book, which is called The Emperor's Feast, A History of China in 12 Meals. And we get to talk about Chinese food. Yay! Welcome, Jonathan. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I love this. We've been like, we've actually been on this Zoom call for about half an hour already, just chewing the fat. Uh, which Mainly is, bitching about people. Just admit Yeah, it. it's, it's how all the best uh, interviews start. Uh, right, okay, I'm going to level with you both straight away. I don't do Chinese food. Ooh. To be fair to me, it's more a problem in Thailand, actually. I have a critical allergy to shellfish, and it's just easier not to do it, because they use like, sauces with oyster shells in and stuff don't they so they do they do yeah. yes. i mean fish, so it's, fish sauce is a major part of a lot of basic chinese you know broths and uh, yeah so it's just easier for me to not i mean i go to thailand to the elephant sanctuary to work and they just put egg fried rice in front of me for seven straight days it's a little bit like one and it's a little bit like i'm a celebrity get me out of here um mm-hmm. so i don't genuinely do it but that doesn't mean i'm not interested jonathan and the I'm, thing is alex is there are times in chinese history where you're uh, seafood allergy would not have been an issue oh really uh, so yeah if you were growing up in the bronze age in uh, in yellow river valley um time of confucius um fish was uh exotic foreign import particularly shellfish it was so it was not the kind of thing that you associated with with fine dining and it was something that the barbarians on the coast ate because you were basically river people so that there's there's no uh, fish sauce in the very earliest um recipes nor and if you were in the Qing dynasty if you were in time of the manchus for example so basically um 1700s 1800s manchus were very big into roast meat and they didn't really do anything else at all um, so you would have been okay at a Manchu banquet. So, you know, within a 3,000 year ballpark, there's at least a couple of meals you could have gone to. Boom. And not just eating egg fried rice. Not just eating egg fried rice. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely love. So. Well, Alina's going to make up for my lack of enthusiasm for Chinese food because uh, she's basically hysterical right now, aren't you? I'm so, anno- I live in a country. Don't get me wrong. I love where I live. I love Poland, love Polish food. Polish people, or if any of you are listening, come on, make some decent Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, some sort of Oriental food that I can eat because it's all disgusting. <laughs> Jonathan, and you live in Finland as well. You you are alive to this. Uh, I yes, I, I live in Finland, and Eastern Europe and the Nordics do have a problem with certain kinds of Chinese food, particularly once you get outside of the main metropolis. And, 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 and this is something that is an evolutionary problem in Chinese food. I mean, this was a problem for Chinese food in Britain in the 1960s. Um, and, you know, we've evolved and hopefully people will evolve here as well. But one of the problems that you always get with, with any kind of ethnic cuisine is that the people who cook it for you aren't necessarily the people who should be cooking it. Mm. Um, so, for example, in America in the 19th century, you have thousands of Chinese laborers turning up. They're, they're digging the wine cellars of the Napa Valley. They are you know, panning for gold. They're, they're building the, the railroad across, across the country. And some of them stay and become cooks. But it doesn't necessarily mean that any of them were cooks before they left China. Do you so, know, this is going to be a problem with Indian food in this country. We were talking to um, a very lovely chap who runs our local Indian restaurant before the world went mad. And he was saying that it's the men that do the cooking in the restaurants and it's passed down from father to son. And the children now aren't following the parents into the trade. They're going off and they're doing different things, which yeah. means that um, the recipes aren't getting passed down to mm. Indians and people of Indian extraction to cook. Mm. So make the most and, of your curry while you can right and, and in, in the case of america of course a lot of these cooks were just throwing together leftovers um which in chinese is za sui um and in tai shan which is the dialect that most of them spoke is sat sui and that's chop suey and it basically means mixed bits and it's whatever we can find whatever we can charge the americans a dollar for in a buffet we will serve <laughs> them um and so that you know completely changes the expectations of the local people about what foreign food should be and so in the case of finland for example we have this we have this recurring issue when a new restaurant opens in town my girlfriend says um oh you know the Finns have opened a new restaurant let's go before they ruin it 
um, <laughs> because you know it, it'll be a couple. And, and there were actually in in Uvascular, where I live in, in in Finland, there was a Thai restaurant here that had a sign they used to put on all the tables, and it said, "We cook our food to meet Finnish expectations. Please let us know if you'd like it done properly." <laughs> <laughs> cold should yeah. we get a narrative going this is going to be brilliant there's so much stuff that's going to come out in this interview about the history of chinese food uh, but first of all because alina's done all the prep for this because she was so excited what inspired you to write this book i think it was really my family that wanted me to do it so that i would shut up at dinner um, <laughs> because i'm afraid and I, I confess going to a chinese restaurant with me is an absolute exercise in irritating pedantry because I will sit there going through all the dishes on the table and telling you where they're from and what they mean and what that means and what that does and where that came from and how you, these people needed to invade before this thing would happen. And, you know, I'll pick up a, a bottle of beer and I'll say, well, this is Qingdao beer. So you realize that, that Shandong was a German colony and that's why they have a brewery there. And everyone just goes, oh, just shut up, write a book. Just, you know, <laughs> tell, tell someone who cares. So I, so I think that's where we are. And I, I, I did, in fact for my sins kind of spend a lot of my childhood in a Chinese restaurant when my dad played in a band so it was always normal for me um and it's it's you know something I'm very passionate about I really love Chinese food and although my, my conception of what Chinese food is has changed hugely you know particularly over the last few years when I've been in China so much and having to you know sample all kinds of things some of which I really wish I wouldn't sample but someone's pointing a camera at you and telling you to try it and you really have to and then you wish you didn't um so let's do you know what I thought about this and you've got so much in your book that we could we could be here all day but I want people to actually go out and buy your book so all right I decided yeah, good, good call <laughs> <laughs> publisher what, will be uh, appreciative well this is the thing when uh, some podcasts get get on this they're like oh well, let's cover the whole book and we just well we don't have the time and I'd rather stick to one aspect of your books so people go oh wow that's really interesting let's go out and buy it so why I decided to do, we're going to go with um, the really, 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 really old stuff like, as far back as we can go. So what we're going to do, we're going to start with Shenong. And I need you to tell us why he's so important in the history of Chinese food. Well, Shenong is a god uh, to the Chinese. Um, and uh, the idea was, was that he was the divine farmer, that he was a, um, in fact, that's what, that's what Shenong means. Shenong means the, the divine farmer. Um, and he was like the great, pioneer for Chinese food. He made the first plow. He taught mankind how to rear food. Uh, he may well have perfected slash and burn cultivation. And quite famously, he would try every single thing he found. He'd put it in his mouth and see if it was poisonous or not. And ultimately, that's what killed him. Um, but Shenong is, is kind of uh, uh, an allegory, if you like, uh, an embodiment of all of those kind of forerunners of the Chinese who you know wondered if that mushroom would tasted nice and wondered what would happen if you boiled that thing um and so uh you know he was probably a real person or in fact even even in the the the, the grand scribes records which is this ancient Chinese book from the Han Dynasty even then they were saying he probably wasn't a god he was probably a clan we're probably misremembering a clan of people who kind of you know perfected agriculture um, but as a result Shenong is the kind of embodiment of 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 epicureanism if you like one thing that is completely synonymous with chinese food for lots of people um and lots of people like me that refuse to even give it a go is chopsticks how yeah. significant are they um is this what every ancient chinese person used to eat with or is this just one example well the chinese did actually have knives and forks in very ancient times um but they tended to stay in the kitchen um, knives in particular, very precious items. You don't really want to just hand them out to people. Um, so there'd be one knife that would be used to chop up the food in the kitchen and a fork would be used to manipulate the big sl uh, you know, slab of meat while you were cutting it up. But then once it was all cut up into individual portions, it would then be you know, given to the, to the individual diners. And you have to remember that the, the table, as we know it, is really a medieval invention. So everyone's sitting in their little individual spot and in the very early days, they used to eat with a, with a thing called a bee, which is a trowel. It's a trowel with a sharp edge. So it's kind of a spoon and it's kind of a knife. It's like a spife, really, I suppose. Mm. Um, and they used to eat with that. They used to eat rice with the hands right up until the hand dynasty. And the chopstick, you know, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, there are, there's evidence of chopsticks in, in Neolithic graves. Um, but the trouble is, is because we, we have a problem, a recurring problem in Chinese archaeology with, with uh, the bamboo limit which is that in the Stone Age, it's very likely the Chinese had all kinds of tools made of bamboo. 
but it's perishable so there's no existence of it so you kind of look at a stone axe and you go well that's rubbish and you go well no maybe, yeah it might be a stone axe but maybe they also had chopsticks maybe they also had all these you know various other items like shovels made of bamboo and stuff but we can't see them anymore the chopstick itself has definitely been around for thousands of years um there's some disagreement among chopstick historians as to exactly when that period starts how um, many chopstick historians are there there's at least two and they hate each other um, <laughs> So it's, it's chopsticks at dawn. Actually, I don't know if they hate each other at all, but they, they do seem to argue an awful lot because one of the problems with the chopstick is it might also be used as a hair ornament. Oh, so, yes. you know, you find a chopstick in a grave. And you're like, was that, you know, some woman, you know, wrapping it up in a little chignon or, or was it half of the, the cutlery? And so archaeological context becomes an issue. You know, where did we find it? Did we find it in a bowl? Did we find it on someone's head? That kind of thing. So there's lots of, lots of arguments about chopsticks, but they've been around for a very long time. They are very useful for eating Chinese food. Um, uh, the, one of the problems the Chinese had when Western food turned up was, was adapting themselves. It's very difficult to eat a lot of Western dishes with chopsticks. Um, so, Imagine eating you know, egg and chips. with ex Exactly. And I, I, I've seen some horrible sights of people trying to eat spaghetti with spoons and all kinds of things in China. Um, because, you know, we tend to forget how the technology of our table also evolves and affects the food that we eat. Mm. Um, so, for example, when, when Deng Xiaoping went to America for his big kind of powwow with um, uh, whoever the president was at the time, I think it was Jimmy Carter, um, they, the, the chefs in the kitchen deliberately cut up everybody's steaks into small chunks because they, they figured the Chinese probably wouldn't be all that au fait with, with how to use a knife and fork. Um, so, um, so yeah, the, the, the chopstick has affected all kinds of elements of the way that Chinese food is, is prepared even today. And that's why, you know, it, it's brought you in little handy, you know, bite-sized pieces. Alex, can you use chopsticks? No. Well, to eat my egg fried rice, no. Don't bother. I've got to tell you, chopsticks, and not, I mean, I can eat, I've been eating with chopsticks since I was like four. This but... is hilarious because you have less, um, what word I'm looking for? coordination than pretty much anyone I've ever met you are a club yeah but the thing is <laughs> now, um, so I had a very serious motorcycle accident back in 2010 and one of the ways I actually rehabilitated my hand was by using chopsticks it was it's such an amazing exercise to be able to eat and I just eat a lot of Chinese food and I just use them and use them and use them as the most amazing thing any excuse frankly pretty much any excuse um the next question i think this is this should alex should have asked this question um because alex likes a lot of alcohol um so alex used to be a bar manager let's just not tell everyone she's a lush <laughs> <laughs> he's a so, cocktail bar manager so talk to us when did uh, when did they start using alcohol do we know um, well, the, the word in Chinese for alcohol, uh, uh, the word in Chinese for wine originally meant a kind of millet ale. Um, and uh, this dates back very, very early in, in, the, in Chinese history. Um, in fact, it may even be that the, the concept of alcohol for human beings um, predates the evolution of human beings. Um, because we have evidence uh, from... Um, the wild of monkeys piling up fruit and letting it rot and then slurping away at the base of it where it's kind of um, alcoholized to some degree. So the concept of getting smashed may in fact be a primate experience. Um, and uh, we certainly have evidence of uh, Neolithic uh, ale brewing uh, capabilities among the Chinese. Uh, and there's this fantastic theory among Chinese archaeologists, which is, is gaining ground and I find very persuasive which is that uh, what we tend to do when we think about the development of booze is we assume that there's a bunch of farmers and they've got a field of grain and they, uh, they eat their food and make their bread or whatever, or their noodles, uh, and then they've got some leftover and they make some beer with it. Um, but there's a, a Chinese um, uh, archaeologist um, several decades ago now suggested this quite radical idea of, of the booze coming first of the idea that the early Chinese aristocracy were a bunch of roving nomad hunters and that they needed booze as part of their sacred rituals because that's the way you see God um, is getting smashed off your face um, and so they would kind of leave little parcels of slaves dotted around and tell them to farm for them to make grain to make booze and that other uses of agriculture like food actually are a secondary purpose is that uh, over time people say you know we could probably eat this as well we don't just have to turn it into booze um so there's been a very long tradition of uh, of ales and then uh 
a developing interest in wine among the Chinese, but um, wine is um, something that really requires, you know, grapes and plums and things to come in um, from the West. Uh, and when I say the West, I mean Central Asia, I don't mean Europe in this case. Um, one recurring issue in Chinese history is strong booze, because there's no real evidence of it existing before the Yuan dynasty, which is the Mongols, so around the 13th century. Um, but there are recipes that seem to call for it from earlier times, and the technology to make it has existed since the Han dynasty. It's existed for 2,000 years. Um, so it seems that it's, there's quite a possibility that strong booze, like kind of vodka or gin, the Chinese version is called baijiu, um, or, or shaojiu, has been invented and forgotten repeatedly throughout Chinese history. That's the only explanation we can find, for example, for recipes from the Song dynasty that say, um, set fire to some wine. It's like you can't set fire to wine unless it's got a high enough alcohol content to not be wine anymore. So, um, but you no, know, that that's only asides in the historical record. There's no uh, there's no evidence of of that kind of distilled alcohol until the time of the Mongols. And the problem with it at the time of the Mongols was it turned them all into alcoholics, because the Mongols spent all their time drinking something that they call kumis or irag, which is basically a slightly fizzy yogurt with a one percent alcohol content. Explains that rampage across Central Europe and. Uh... Uh, well, Asia into Europe, doesn't it? Well, well, the Mongols are big into you know massive drinking, you know quaffing huge amounts, you know by the jugful because it takes a lot of kumis to get your your squiffy. And of course, they go to China, and I don't know if you've seen a baijiu glass, but it's the size of a thimble mm. because you're, you're you're drinking this massively strong alcohol. And you're supposed to drain your glass to show sincerity. So of course, the Mongols were just got very drunk very quickly, and many of the descendants of Genghis Khan in, ended up um, dying of alcohol poisoning. Sad. Yeah, sad, sad, sad. Poor, Mon poor Mongols. Poor, poor Mongols. Mongols. Poor, poor Mongols. little Mongols. Uh, I'm pretty sure they levelled up the score in terms of a death count for the other side. Um, food hygiene is that culturally different in China throughout history? Is it what? How do they deal with the, the things like lack of refrigeration and stuff like that? Well, there was refrigeration in China um, from from at least the Han Dynasty onwards. They had ice houses. Um, which they would make great use of. And, and they discovered early on that, that if you dug down, when building a grave, if you dug down to a certain depth, it would get quite cold and that would help you preserve the ice. So ice houses as a way of uh, preserving food uh, have long been a, a possibility in China. Um, uh, but and when it comes to food hygiene, Confucius, in the Book of Rites, in, in the ancient classics like the Book of Rites, there are commentaries about food hygiene about what kind of vegetables not to eat about how you have to avoid you know dog's kidneys if you possibly can um and by the tang dynasty so we're talking about the early middle ages now um uh, if you didn't pursue the correct degree of food hygiene it was a capital offense in the imperial kitchens because of course you're getting a lot of people accused of poisoning each other particularly in the tang dynasty and so that the, the cooks in the kitchen have to be super super careful with how they serve the food um, but of course there's no concept of germs uh, until the early modern period um, so there are various ways that the Chinese uh, I think evolved to disinfect their food I mean in, in the most ancient times everything was boiled let's face it that's going to dis disinfect things very nicely including the chopsticks that you're sticking into the stew um, and once we get to the Han dynasty we have uh, querns for, for making grain, which can also be used to make oil. And we also have a better technology for making uh, what we would now call woks. Um, so um, once you get to the hand in the seat, you have, you, you're able to heat food, to stir fry food to a much greater degree. And that's going to kill off a lot of germs as well. Um, so you know, there, are, there are various kinds of, of you know, food hygiene issues cropping up in the historical record from the earliest times. Um, but th there's also some, you know, terrifying stories like one ancient king who who saw a slug in his salad and decided to eat it because he assumed it was supposed to be there. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, top tip, don't do that. You just brought up woks and it's just given me a really bad flashback to my <laughs> childhood days. Genius here, as a, as a little child, decided to wash my dad's wok with a Brillo pad. Oh, <laughs> Um, so basically, for people that don't know what happens, if you wash it with a Brillo pad, it rusts. 
and it completely and utterly destroys the whole wok so you've got to chuck it I, I think my dad was fuming at me for days after that good job you're an only child really isn't it you're a disaster area that is true that is very true but um <laughs> talking talking about confucius because you brought confucius up and you've written the book mm-hmm. um what did he have for dinner what did Confucius have to do? Well, uh, he would, um, he was very particular about his food. This is one of the things that they, they mentioned about him. They, 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 firstly, it's worth bearing in mind that Confucius was a very tall man. His dad was six foot six and Confucius himself was, was about six foot one, like me. Uh, so in, even in China, that's pretty big. Um, and Shandong, where he came from, still has the best basketball team in China. Uh, for obvious reasons Um, and so what he did have was a large amount of body mass so he was able to drink quite a lot without getting tipsy which was you know quite handy at the odd the odd banquet Um, but the kind of food that Confucius liked um, there's a very very nice uh, recipe in the book of rites um, for something called uh, the I think it's called the great bake uh, where you uh, you you, um, boil a, a a pig um, in a kind of stew for several days. You let it simmer for several days until it's incredibly kind of soft and you serve it on a, on a sort of fried crack, uh, fried in its own crackling. Um, all kinds of interesting recipes in the Book of Rites, um, but in Confucius's case, what the, the point that they make about him repeatedly in the Confucian classics is that he didn't uh, take the piss when it came to uh, food. He would always make sure that he had just a little sparing amount of something um, that he wouldn't he, he, he wouldn't just have the toppings. He would also make sure that he had the, the millet uh, um, or the rice as well in, in reasonable amounts. There is something that was said about Confucius and his attitudes at mealtimes that has really made life difficult for some people in China, including me, which was that uh, there's, a con- there's a, a, an offhand comment in, in one of the Confucian classics that says he didn't really talk while he ate. <laughs> and I take this to mean that he, I mean, you know, classical Chinese is an incredibly terse language, so that there's, there's lots of wiggle room. I just took it to mean he, did, he didn't kind of make small talk a whole lot, because um, there's plenty of evidence in the Book of Rites that people did talk at banquets, and there are toasts, and there are conversations. Um, but I was at a, a Confucian school in Shandong, where they actually teach according to the principles of the Book of Rites, the young Chinese kids. And uh, we had to eat in complete silence, um, and including guests. So, so I was there with the film crew, and there's all these kind of kids sitting there eating in the canteen. And we all had to sit there and not say a word like we were monks for 30 minutes. And I'm trying to have a conversation with the director about whether or not we can put the drone up in the temple. And we're having to do it all by sign language. Um, so that was very frustrating. Um, it's a little spin-off that I don't suppose Confucius was expecting, or indeed worries 2,500 years after he's dead. I don't think he really cares. How did the Qing dynasty change food in China? Ah, well, I, I suppose what you're asking is what difference does it make that the Qing dynasty were invaders, that they were Manchus and they came from another place and they were, they were a, a nomad people who took over China in 1644. And so the Qing dynasty were very keen on roast meat. That's what they say. A Manchu banquet is basically nothing but, but roast meat. Um, and you just have to pig out on it until you can eat no more. And then you get up and walk out um, after wiping your greasy fingers on your boots. Um, and of course, because they were a conquering people, um, the people that they conquered, the Chinese, didn't necessarily want Manchu food themselves. So you get this kind of varying menu. And you have these... Uh, corporate events these kind of government events where you have uh, all kinds of different levels of menu depending on the rank of the person who's being served so the manchus are getting weird stuff like just big hunks of roast meat and the high-ranking chinese are getting goose maybe and the lower ranking chinese are getting chicken which was always a kind of the, the last resort option in a lot of chinese food up until a couple of hundred years ago um and uh Unfortunately, there, there are some people who've, who've seen the menu for this kind of banquet with 108 different dishes on it, which are all aimed at kind of different classes, and assume that that's one big meal. And so for £44,000, you can go to a restaurant in Beijing today and be served the Manchu banquet, um, which takes about a year to get through. I mean, you have to come back repeatedly on different days. And, and so they've got this idea in their head that, you know, some impossibly fat Chinese guy sat down one day and had 108 courses. Um, but that is a, a bit of a confusion about Qing Dynasty food that has, uh, has kind of retained to this day. The other thing about the Qing Dynasty 
is the prolonged and extensive contact with foreigners which of course made a huge difference to Chinese food because the Chinese were being confronted with things they'd never had to deal with before or that they had before and forgotten about. Um, so when it comes to dealing with, with large-scale contact with foreigners, uh, the Ming Dynasty before the Qing Dynasty is the one that, where, where we get the Colombian exchange, where we get all these new foods turning up from America. And that transforms you know, food and agriculture all the way around the world, not just in China. But in the Qing Dynasty, when we get the treaty ports when we get Hong Kong being handed over to the British, suddenly the Chinese are put kind of face to face uh, with Europeans and Americans for the first time. Um, and they are experimenting with each other's foods and often hating it. I mean, there's all kinds of fantastically racist comments made by the Americans and the British about how terrible Chinese food is. And also, to be fair, lots of fantastically racist comments from the Chinese about how terrible uh, European food is as well. Um, so they didn't really see eye to eye on this. And there's only a few foods that kind of wormed their way in um, either way. I mean, tea being one of them, of course, obviously, traveling around the world. Um, Chinese have never been that keen on coffee, uh, although that's changing today, uh, particularly with the rise of, you know, Starbucks and various related franchises. Um, you know, the tomato is something the Chinese just can't really get their heads around. There's only one real tomato dish in China, which is tomatoes and eggs. And even then, that only became a thing in the 1940s when the tomato growers of Shanghai didn't have any foreigners to sell tomatoes to anymore because the Japanese had taken over. So um, there's uh, so, so those are, I suppose, are the, are the two main issues with, with the Qing dynasty, foreign contact, but also the fact that the Manchus themselves were also foreigners, which you're not supposed to say anymore in China. Everyone's supposed to be one big happy melting pot. But frankly, they were invaders. And so they brought with them a very different kind of culture, not unlike the culture that the, the Mongols brought in the Middle Ages as well, but which the Chinese had been you know, resisting and trying to purge from their society for a couple of hundred years since. Talking about people that are not supposed to be there, probably got the wrong way I'm saying this, but you've got, you've got the Chu people as well. So how did they fall into this narrative? Now, the Chu people, you're talking about the very, very ancient um, uh, Chu people, right? You're the, so um, before the time of the first emperor, so before you know, 220 BC, um, China didn't really exist as a concept. Um, it, it wasn't one big country and one unified people. It was a whole bunch of different countries that were fighting each other. And after the conquest of the first emperor and then the collapse of his empire and then the, the beginning of the, of, the, of the Han Dynasty, which lasted for 400 years and is roughly coterminous with the Roman Empire, um, these, th th there's this kind of moment when... The Chinese have been unified by this despot and they're trying to decide whether or not to keep this idea of there being one emperor ruling one huge country that's supposed to be the whole world or whether they should kind of break up again. And Chu was one of the bigger states in the pre-Chinese world. It's basically, uh, well, by, by the time it fell, it was, it was most of the area south of the Yangtze, a huge area uh, which was associated in the Chinese mind with kind of hot-headedness and barbarity um, and some kind of odd ideas for food. Uh, but what Chu had was a border with Indochina, um, so it had access to sugarcane. And so Chu foods, uh, you know, some of them had this kind of reputation for being kind of hot and horrible, um, but also they, they had a lot of sugar, and that was quite weird in Chinese food. The people of Chu were also nutters, uh, plainly. I mean, they had all kinds of weird things. There's one food that they had, which was a basically more like a medicine and a spell, really. You get a bunch of dangerous insects, like a spider and a poisonous caterpillar and a scorpion, and you throw them into a bowl and make them fight each other. And then after they've killed each other, you kind of grind them up and, and make this kind of pill. Um, I'm not sure what it's supposed to cure now. Um, I'm, I mean, not that I've tried one, you know, you're, you know ask your doctor and... Uh, see if he can give you one of them. The Han Dynasty. We've mentioned them a couple of times already. Yeah. They give historians a fantastic insight into food and cooking during their time period. Why is that and how do they do that? Well, the great thing about the Han Dynasty uh, was they, um, they buried people with grave goods in a very kind of Egyptian style. They'd have representations of ev everything that uh, they would take with them into the afterlife. Um, and of course, you know, their, their predecessors did something similar. It's not like the terracotta army isn't a thing. 
Um, but in the hand industry, they, they do little miniature versions of people's everyday life, and they would do kind of models of the, the palace they could expect in the afterlife. And because these things were made of pottery, um, they were worthless to grave robbers. And so, uh, you know, 2,000 years on, you can dig up a hand grave, and yeah, maybe someone's nicked all the gold, but the, the models of the house are still there, and the, 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 the ceremonial food stuff is still there. So, for example, at Marwong Dwe uh, in 1972, which is a, a place, it's actually in, in the old state of Chu, it's in Changsha, um, they were building a, a, an underground shelter for, as part of a hospital construction, and, and they found this massive tomb, which had fantastic preserved manuscripts, um, but also models of someone's kitchen. So we know, without a doubt, that the modern Chinese kitchen range, which is kind of a bonfire with a sort of giant wok over the top of it, is pretty much standard for the last 2,000 years. And we, we can actually see that from the Ma Wong Dui evidence. Um, so there, there's uh, what, what the, the great stuff about the Han Dynasty is, is the, the level of material that we can get our hands on and the fact it hasn't been nicked. Um, so, you know, if, if they'd made a wok out of gold, that would have been stolen and, and melted down a long time ago. But the great thing about finds like Ma Wong Dui is it's all incredibly mundane and in the eyes of the average thief, worthless. I think we should start talking about some uh, some fan favourites of food. Cause You're just right. getting hungry doing this, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm actually going to do is we've got a break after this. I'm going to go shopping. <laughs> 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 See what I can find. Right, so um, I've put soy sauce on the list because soy beans and soy sauce, are, they're, they're really important ingredients in Chinese cooking. Mm -hmm. When did they appear in history? Actually coming up with a specific date for soy sauce is almost impossible, uh, as it is for a lot of other Chinese foods um, in the very, very early times because we have a kind of Dark Age manuscript uh, called the Qi Min Yao Shu, and that was um, from the, I think, from the Sixth Dynasty. So, so we're looking after the end of the Han Dynasty, around about so the fifth, sixth century AD. Um, and in many cases, that is the first manuscript to discuss all kinds of processes. One of them being uh, fermentation um, and its uses in um, in making food. Um, so when it comes to fermentation, in fact, when it comes even to, to brewing alcohol, we have a, a like a 3000 year ballpark um, in which it may have started, but the first actual recipe we have for it is not until what we would call the Dark Ages. Um, uh, and the thing about the soybean is, is that it is very difficult to turn it into an edible food. If you, if you just boil a soybean, you get this inedible mush and you don't get very, very good um, uh, calories from it at all. All it does is make you fart, which uh, several Chinese ancient manuscripts say. <laughs> they don't say it quite like that. They say soybeans make you feel heavy. Um, soybeans make you feel bloated. But actually, you're farting like a warthog if you don't ferment them or treat them in some way. Um, so in the late Han Dynasty, early Dark Ages, we get the invention of tofu, which is obviously a great way of, of, um, of processing soy to make it more edible. Um, um, and, and we have soy sauce, which, uh, you know, is a fantastic condiment um, because salt is such a vital part of, uh, of the Chinese diet. It's one of the essential five flavors. Um, and soy sauce allows you to really extend the use of your, of your salt. Uh, much further than you would normally plan, uh, much further than you could if you just kind of sc scooped up a handful of it and, and threw it into a dish. Um, so fermenting soy sauce and actually making, uh, basically there's two, there's a soy jam and then there's soy sauce, but basically there are, these are two condiments that are absolutely vital in Chinese cookery. Not the least because the government has a monopoly on salt. Salt is a taxable commodity in China for big chunks of its history. So anything that you can do to use salt in, 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 in a soy sauce form is cheaper and allows you to you know, spread your money further. And this is still an issue today. I, I was hosting, I was looking after a, a family that had visited from Finland and they'd come to Xi'an in China and I was taking them around the shops and, and they wanted to get some bread and they wanted to get some butter and some various things. And the wife said, can we get some salt? And I'd never bought any in China before. I didn't know where to look. I said, well, there's monosodium glutamate over there and there's soy sauce over there. And I actually, I actually had to go to the foreign section of the supermarket, you know, with all the weird exotica. 
Uh, <laughs> Does that include like Walker's Crisps in China? Like Walker's Crisps? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> there's a supermarket in China that's just done a deal with Tesco's. So you're kind of walking down the aisle and looking at all this normal Chinese stuff and suddenly there's a packet of Tesco's Crisps and you're like, what's that doing there? It's like a <laughs> monolith out of 2001. Oh, they um, get everywhere, don't they? They get Tesco. everywhere, Tesco's, yeah. So uh, I can't remember what the question was now. Oh, yeah, soy sauce. So, yeah, great stuff. Very handy, uh, very useful. Um, I've actually been to the factory in Amoy, where, uh, which has the biggest soy sauce. Um, oh, they're the famous one, aren't they? Amoy. I don't, well, um, the, the brand Amoy is famous, but Amoy yeah. is, a shaman is a, is a place in, in China, which uh, mm. is called Amoy in the local dialect. And, and so that's a brand name. But within Shaman, within the city of Amoy, there are all kinds of soy sauce factories. And I went to one... Uh, and kind of poked around there and they, they have these giant jars of soy sauce so they, they get the beans and they they put them in a sort of sauna for three days they can make them go moldy and then they throw them into these giant vats like the size of a bean bag um and they they, they cover them with water so there's kind of anaerobic um, um fermentation um, and then they just leave them for months um, but when I say they just leave them, they actually, um, they put these, these little hats on them, these little straw hats on, onto the vats. And it's the job of the, of the soy sauce masters to kind of patrol these, uh, th- this huge area, like the size of two football fields, patrol these lines and lines and lines of vats and to take the straw hats off or to put them back on again to, to keep the temperature kind of vaguely, um, at the same level. So you can't do it in a, in a place that has winter. You can only do it in kind of South China where, where the temperature is you know, relatively consistent all year round. And you need to be an absolute master at kind of working out when it's 21 degrees and when it's 22 degrees and, and that kind of thing. And, but you do it by taking these hats on and off. Um, and uh, it looks very odd to see all of these you know, long lines of, of, of vats just sitting out there in the sunshine. And uh, when Chairman Mao saw a, a soy sauce factory at, at work, he refused to ever have soy sauce again because he regarded it as really unhygienic and horrible. Um, but that's another story. It is. And I want to ask you something different. I want to ask. Where, so, <laughs> <laughs> so moving swiftly on, I want yeah. to know Western food. When does that start appearing in China and ruining everything, basically? Well, firstly, I would be remiss as a historian to point out that when you say Western food, that doesn't necessarily mean Western food. This um, is true. Food stuffs have been drifting into China from the West um, for, for millennia. Um, and All many... right. Let me rephrase my question. All right. When does McDonald's arrive and start making Chinese people fat? Oh, that'll be the 1990s. Basically, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, about 1983, there are big reforms. Deng Xiaoping uh, takes over after the fall of Mao and the, and the Gang of Four that tried to succeed him. And there's this great opening up of China. And, and suddenly, after years of telling people that Coca-Cola is an evil capitalist you know, weapon and that you know, uh, McDonald's is, is awful and that Kentucky Fried Chicken is terrible, suddenly these franchises start opening up in China. Um, and so you get uh, from the, the particularly the late 80s onwards, I think the first McDonald's, I think it was in Wong Fu Jing in about 1991. It was relatively late. Um, but you get these, these, these through franchises opening up and they, they are not necessarily the way that they are in other countries. Kentucky Fried Chicken, for example, is a much nicer experience in China than it is in Britain. I guess no, I can't be silly and dead in one. The smell outside makes you feel oh, sick. Oh, but the thing is, is that they don't just sell you fried chicken. In fact, that's a relatively minor component. They sell you curry in a Chinese Kentucky fried chicken, and they'll sell it to you with um, with Chinese tea as well. It's actually very nice. Um, and so uh, you, you get these um, uh, franchises starting up. Kentucky fried chicken in particular has been incredibly successful in China. Uh, McDonald's is doing very well for itself as well. Um, uh, Before although, I moved you on to that, though, I think what you were explaining to us was Silk Road stuff's always moved up and down. Well, yes, absolutely. And, and so there are all kinds of foods in China from Central Asia uh, which, and, and India, which have drifted into China. And you can normally tell which ones they are because they have the name barbarian or West in their name. So a melon, for example, is shigua, which means a, a barbarian, a Western melon. And uh, pepper is hujiao, the barbarian fagara. Um, <laughs> barbarian curry yeah a uh, uh, fancia <laughs> is a is a barbarian aubergine which is a tomato um so there, there are all these words in chinese that retain within them the the clue that they've, they've drifted in from india or or, or central asia um 
so uh so so yes so that, that that's why i i kind of i balked at the question because w we think about the west as meaning us and we think mm. about it as being europe and america um and that's certainly a thing i mean the the, the colombian exchange made a huge difference to china um and also to America, you know, we don't get we don't get soybeans growing in America until the 1700s. You know, Orange County in California is named for the oranges, but they didn't have citrus there until it was brought by um, by, by foreigners. Um, so th there's all kinds of exchanges of, of, of food that comes from the West. And uh, for much of Chinese history, it is it is literally coming from west of China. And then from the Ming Dynasty onwards, it starts to come in from the east as well, because you get the Portuguese and the Spanish showing up, you know, with with stuff from America, like the yam, for example, which transformed the economy of South China, um, and other crops that aren't even food, like tobacco, um, which made a huge difference as well uh, for, for plantation croppers in the South. Um, so, so, but yes, to answer your, your question, Western food starts ruining things for the Chinese, uh, <laughs> as we might say, um, in the late 20th century. Um, but also the, the, the to some extent, the Chinese have ruined things for themselves as well. There's, there's a, a phenomenon which has been termed fat flats, <laughs> which, which, is, which is that, you know, if you're, if you're a, a 1980s average Chinese person, you're growing up in a, in a city block that's more like a little village and the houses are quite low and everyone's friendly and there are little restaurants and, and grocers and, and whatnot. By the time you get into the 21st century, that's all been bulldozed and it's been replaced by a giant skyscraper. And your family are living in a little flat in a skyscraper, which has a kitchen, but it might not necessarily be good for anything more than boiling water. Hmm. And so that, they've been called fat flats because the temptation there, which the designers of the building kind of hope you're going to fall for, is for you to get in the elevator and go down 10 floors and go to the restaurants in the basement uh, on the, you know, the, the ground floors. So normally there's like a shopping center in the you know first couple of floors and then there'll be a the the, the tower block above it um and so it's very tempting you know if you are an underclass modern chinese person working in a factory and in, in a dorm eating junk food or if you are a new middle class and in a fat flat and tempted to just go out and get something from a restaurant or even to order in so this is, is, is pushing people, it's tempting people to, to not cook for themselves. And that itself is becoming you know, something of an issue. Because obesity is a new problem in China, isn't it? Yes, it, because it is. Because of this. It used to be. I mean, there, there, was a very, there was a brief period in Chinese history when, when fat was pretty. Um, basically, in the height of the Tang Dynasty, uh, after the time of... And Empress Wu was a big girl, incidentally. Uh, very famously um, and the Tang dynasty at its very height was a very prosperous place and and as with with many other cultures around the world prosperity itself was was signified through through being well fed and so you get a period of about 100 150 years where the definition of beauty in China in the middle ages is based on being a, a woman with a fuller figure um, you know boobs become a thing uh, for for one happy century um, <laughs> and uh, and, and then, and then, kind of the art, and, and you you can actually see it in fashions and in art that that starts to fade away again, and kind of stick thin becomes the new norm again. Um, and so, so obesity has been a thing in the Chinese past, um, but not as an endemic social problem. And, and of course, what we have now in modern China is is the the phenomenon of, of the so-called little emperors. You get Chinese kids because of the one-child policy, which has only recently been repealed. You get the, all of the love of an entire family of four grandparents and two parents is concentrated on a single child. So yes. they, they were getting incredibly spoiled, fed all the treats that they wanted. They're growing up. They don't have brothers and sisters and they don't have cousins either. So you get this very kind of lonely generation um, that is often eating its feelings. Um, and so that in itself was also uh, um, uh, an issue as well that's, that's contributed to this factor. Um, obesity is not the big food issue in, in Chinese health. Um, alcoholism and tobacco <laughs> are, the, are the two real issues, I think, uh, at the moment. Um, but so, yeah, obesity is certainly a growing problem. And you do see bigger Chinese people around as well. Um, and so, so sometimes it gets quite, I, I, I almost mansplained a couple of women in a, in a Kentucky fried chicken once because I was there with my son because he, don't, don't get me started, but he wanted chips. 
um, and there are these two absolutely beautiful Chinese girls sitting opposite, opposite us, hoovering up this massive bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I wanted to say, just stop, stop. You don't have to do this. I don't want to be here. You don't have to be. But I thought, you know, it wasn't my place. So I kind of left them to it. I sat next to a Chinese guy on, well, I didn't, hilariously, my friend did, on a really short flight in Thailand from um, Chiang Mai down to Bangkok. And his blood sugar was so bad that, like, literally, he hoovered up two of these wraps that they gave out on the flight. And, like, he couldn't stay awake for five minutes watching the telly. He, like, he literally was narcoleptic. And I was like, that's your blood sugar doing that. That's because you're so unhealthy. He was very large. And I just thought, you're, you're just going, you're going to be dead by 50. Oh, let's not be judgy. He might just I have been know. working very hard. I know. But, yeah, that's what it looked like. He just, I mean, he was obviously on business. And I wonder if that's mm. just running around Southeast Asia on business, not eating healthy, not sleeping properly, not exercising. Mm. But it was like watching a nature program because I don't think I'd ever met someone <laughs> where it was quite so obvious. I, I feel I was. must leap to the defence of 1.4 billion Chinese people just for a moment and point out that there is a another tradition within China that often wrong foots foreigners and that is of the, the midday siesta I mean what time was your flight 9am oh okay well I, yeah. I, I can't help you then I can't this, help you this, this poor chap just wasn't in a good way I'm not saying all Chinese people look like that at all but I just I looked at him and I thought oh your lifestyle must be doing this to you <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, go on, Alina, because China has something brilliant that they've given us. Yeah, because I love it. I drink it all the time. Oh, that hand gives it away what it is. <laughs> uh, tea, Chinese tea. When does that come into China? Well, tea itself has been around in China <clears throat> since time immemorial. The, uh, I mean, it's a prehistoric item um, growing in, in Yunnan in, in, in South China. Um, uh, what, what the issue with tea really is when the Chinese realise what it is. In the Han Dynasty, so 2,000 years ago, tea is found in some Han Dynasty tombs, but it's filed with the medicines. It's kind of a pickle. It's used as a, as a, as a pill to kind of wake you up um, because the insomniac properties of tea were observed from an early time. It's only in the Tang Dynasty, um, particularly uh, the, uh, the 8th century onwards AD, that you get people like Lu Yu, who wrote the classic of tea, actually defining what it is, precisely what leaf it is, where it has to come from on the tree, how to make it properly. You have the origins of the tea ceremony. Um, you have Buddhism coming into China and discouraging people from drinking alcohol. The monks are drinking tea to keep themselves awake during med meditation. And the new kind of class of Buddhists uh, in the aristocracy are drinking tea because it's better for them than alcohol. And it's not, and the thing is, Buddha never mentioned tea. If he had, he might have banned it, but he never mentioned tea, so you could just drink as much of it as you like. So tea becomes a thing in China uh, from uh, the 8th century AD onwards. Um, and, and then, of course, it proliferates in all kinds of different ways and all kinds of different kinds of it. Um, and uh, you know, it's, you know, when, when you drink tea, you're boiling the water, which means that you are disinfecting it. It's keeping you awake. It's a nice way of uh, interacting with people. I, I don't know if any of you have have hung out with people in China. Um, but in, when, when I was wandering around with the National Geographic film crew, we'd often end up in people's houses waiting for a shot to be set up or something. And the Chinese have a kind of tea ceremony. They have a sort of faffy thick set of rituals that you go through to boil the water and rinse the cups and do the thing and mix the other thing. And it kind of keeps their hands busy and people kind of chat around it. It's nowhere near as, as up itself as the Japanese tea ceremony, but it, it, it has kind of similar elements to it. And so this, this idea of kind of pottering around over a tray of teacups is something that the Chinese have done for centuries. And it's very much you know, part of their kind of general social you know, activities. Um, and unless you're drinking incredibly posh tea, it's quite a cheap way of entertaining people as well. Of course, tea does get incredibly posh. Um, I, I have actually drunk a cup of the most expensive tea that there is. Um, I'm jealous. Uh, well, was it good? To be honest, it tasted like tea. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, I was I was at this tea farm and uh, I was given a sachet. So you know, I mean, literally the size of a tea bag, like that, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and the sachet itself was worth about 900 pounds or something. And, and the tea grower said, oh, you try that. This is really amazing stuff. You all will be amazed. And, and so I, I walked around for months carrying this sachet of tea, trying to work out how I could kind of do it justice. And in the end, we, we brewed up a pot with my mother 
at Christmas and we drank it and went, eh, tastes like tea. Um, so there is a kind of, I, I can tell the difference between a one-year-old, two-year-old and five-year-old tea, um, for like a, a iron guan yin tea or something like that. I can tell the difference between the bushes because um, I had to learn how to do that uh, for a documentary I was in. But beyond you know, being able to tell you roughly what kind of age the leaves are, Oh, it's, it's, it's like fine wine to a Philistine like me. You reach a certain point and you don't really feel the benefit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I tried that monkey poo coffee in <laughs> Thailand um, that's supposed to be, like, it's really expensive and it's supposed yeah. to be because a monkey's eaten it and shat it out. It's supposed <laughs> yeah. to be the best coffee ever. Um, and it was just so fruity, it was undrinkable. Just the taste wasn't Also, coffee. I think you get this idea in your head that you are drinking monkey shit. It's, it's, it's civic yeah. shit normally. Yeah. Um, and and you think why why would I put myself through? someone is having a laugh somewhere? Yeah, someone um, is selling this pack for sixteen pound for about mm, four teaspoons and just mm. cracking up laughing. Sorry, I lie. That wasn't Thailand. That was Peru. Alina would not forgive me if we didn't go down this route to finish off with you. This has been brilliant. This just you are like a minefield of information. No wonder your family can't <laughs> stand going for a meal with you. Uh, but Alina wants to talk favourite Chinese food. Right. If I do eat Chinese, I usually have sweet and sour chicken hong kong style because um, mm-hmm. i'm very boring and that's my contribution to the the thing but alina what's your obsession ah uh, the one and only thing that i desperately cannot get in this country are spring rolls and the best place to get two places in in london one is in hackney don't judge me okay mm-hmm. hackney um and the other one there was a restaurant a friend of mine owned a vietnamese restaurant who made the most amazing spring roll in the world but they shut down so um my kind of yeah i can't get them anymore so it's kind of sad boo what's your favorite jonathan oh god um it's very difficult to say because you know i keep developing favorites as time goes on um and uh i can't tell you what my latest obsession would be for a long time i mean once again please don't judge me for a long time i just loved egg fried rice which in china is like a kid's meal Mm. um so we go out with people and i'd wait for someone else to ask for egg fried rice so i could judge them but also have some um so i went through that and also i used to love when i was younger as a teenager i used to love singapore noodles which have nothing to do with singapore uh was invented in in, uh, uh, in hong kong by, by a chef trying to, to do something exotic using a bit of curry i can tell you what my least favorite chinese food is though is it something... seven organ soup <laughs> oh oh i dream of seven organ soup <laughs> <What am> I... <laughs> it's something it's something called nyo bier um which is literally a cow's last meal you kill your cow and you rip out its intestines and in its intestines there is half digested grass no and so and you wring that out so you've got this sort of green gloopy soup that tastes a little bit like you've thrown up in the back of your mouth and then you use that as a sort of jus to to cook your actual meal um and the thing is is this is a delicacy among uh, the gum people of, of south china uh, one of the chinese ethnic minorities and it's quite fascinating because you can see when you taste it it's kind of peppery and you think okay so in a world before pepper in a world before chili this would have been how people got that kind of acrid taste but you are also drinking stuff out of a cow's ass basically yeah uh, so I, I was never really that keen on it uh, I tried. I offered it round all the film crew. None of them wanted it for some reason. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, should we do any... the elephant in the room while we're talking about disgusting Chinese food? Then, which is this Western thing about Chinese people eating cats and dogs? Yeah. I went to. I did stay with a tribe in northern Viet, uh, northern Thailand that did eat dogs. I don't think it's legal now, but that it was part of their culture historically eating black dogs i think don't know why specifically black but is it actually a chinese thing or is this just casual western racism is it casual well i think the easy answer is it's casual racism unfortunately there are people who eat dogs uh in china still um the 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 law about dog eating is getting progressively stricter all the time uh, not just in china but also in, in taiwan um so it used to be that you you couldn't sell dog meat and then it was you couldn't buy it and then it was you weren't allowed to prepare it you weren't allowed to offer it in a restaurant even so in in the in north east china in uh in 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 the area that you should maybe call manchuria uh you know it's often on the korean border and there are dog restaurants there also down in the very very south of china around, particularly around yunnan you'll see dog uh on some menu somewhere but it is it is highly discouraged there is this 
infamous festival where they eat dog meat um, sometimes. But even even the Chinese authorities are trying to clamp down on that. Um, the eating of dogs has become progressively more frowned upon over the centuries. Um, basically, by the Tang Dynasty, by the Middle Ages, uh, dog recipes are included in cookbooks, but they're included as um, weird anachronisms, historical anomalies that no one really has anymore. Um, the Chinese are actually much, much kinder to their dogs than you might think. Um, so, so yes, the, this, this idea that the Chinese eat dogs, uh, or indeed the, 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 the Vietnamese do, is something that is, uh, owes much more to kind of right-wing um, agitation than anything else. There is an issue within modern Chinese food, however, which dog meat does cross over into, and as do other forms of bush meat, and that's bush meat itself. Um, so not just dog, but, you know, pangolin, some turtles, all kinds of weird stuff that is not Pangolins really... are almost extinct now, aren't they, because of this? Because of this. And, and, and it's, not, it's less to do with Chinese food uh, than it is to do with Chinese medicine. Um, so, for example, uh, selling uh, exotic species in a wet market, which is probably what gave us the zoonotic disease transfer that led to COVID-19 mm -hmm. in Wuhan, is illegal in China. In fact, it's a capital offence now and has been since February last year. However, right after that, um, there was this kind of mitigating uh, uh, argument that was put forward by a, a, a traditional medicine organisation that said, yeah, but uh, you cannot disparage or libel Chinese traditional medicine. And so we have this hypothetical situation now where I see a man selling a pangolin in a market because the scales are good for pregnancy. I don't know if you knew that, but pangolin scales, very good for, you know, helping you through a pregnancy, uh, says Chinese doctors. Um, and I say, you're selling a pangolin. That's illegal. I'm going to report you to the police. You're going to be executed. And he says, yeah, but I'm selling a medical pangolin and you're not allowed to disparage Chinese medicine. So who's mm. laughing now? Um, so, the, you know, the, the you know, legislation comes in and it's really you know, powerful and strong and very, very convincing. And then, you know, something comes along and cocks it up. And, and in fact, I do end up talking for much of my final chapter about food security and food hygiene in China, because you get these massive scandals in China about food hygiene. Um, and, and, and the thing is, is that if you, if you want to look at it from a positive way, they're massive scandals because they're clamping down so hard. Yeah, it's a and work in progress, isn't it? It is. And, you know, and you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with, you know, 1.4 billion people. So even a small anomaly like melamine in milk or um, people using uh, acidified human hair to make fake soy sauce, you know, can, can turn into truckloads and truckloads of, 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 of condemned food by the ton. So it, it looks kind of scary from the outside. And, 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 and food security itself, uh, security in general is one of the pillars of Xi Jinping thought. So the, the current you know, uh, ruler, head of state in China, is very keen on, on guaranteeing his people that they're, they're going to be kept safe and they're going to be kept safe from foreign aggression. They're going to be kept safe from climate change, hopefully, and they're going to be kept safe in terms of food security. And so what this has resulted in is massive Chinese initiatives to protect the Chinese food supply not just in terms of hunting down people who are selling dodgy food or condemned food, uh, for example. It used to be legal to sell condemned food in China, as long as you said what it was. Mm, that's not good. <laughs> you can say, you can say, the sell-by date's gone on this, but you can have it anyway, as long as you understand that it might kill you. Uh, but anyway, that, that's all changed now. But, but, but also uh, securing the food chain outside of China. You know, China is, uh, is not self-sufficient in certain you know, major crops like soybeans, for example, or palm oil. So it's plantationing that out to other countries. And we have issues, for example, such as in Australia, you can have a dairy in Australia that's owned by the Chinese and run by the Chinese and staffed by the Chinese and only supplies milk to China, but it's in Australia. Oh, wow. And you have farmers in Africa who are growing crops, not to feed Africans, but to feed animals that are supplying the Chinese meat market. So you, you have this issue whereby um, uh, it, it's oddly analogous, analogous to the way that the, uh, when, when, the, when the British first showed up in China, they wanted tea and they were prepared to you know, sell the Chinese drugs to get it. Um, and uh, I've spoken in public in, in China, much to, much to people's annoyance, about the, uh, the, the similarities between the way the British started behaving in China 
and the way the Chinese are behaving overseas. Um, because uh, although there's a lot of kind of kumbaya nationalism and a lot of, you know, we're, we're all happy and we're all trading and it's one belt and it's one road and, and, and it's all good for the, for the global economy, what's actually happening is huge sectors of foreign countries are being snapped up to supply the Chinese market. And that's all, you know, that's good capitalism at work, um, but there is, a, there is a cost, there is an environmental cost and a human cost at the sharp end, uh, which is affecting those countries. Um, and uh, actually, I find it quite admirable the way that the, the, the Communist Party and the rulers of China have, have come up with this you know, very secure food chain for themselves. But you know, at some point, someone's going to say, well, we could use that land ourselves to grow stuff for ourselves as well. And, and as, as the world becomes increasingly competitive over food security, over water, I can see that rubbing a lot of people up the wrong way. The scope of your book, Jonathan, is huge, and we have ducked around all over the place today. So for the purposes of people listening who are fascinated by everything you've got to say, tell us about the book, um, which is A History of China in 12 Meals. Um, okay, well, the, the idea is uh, very, very simply to tell the history of China through food. Um, it's something I've done before. I told the history of China through martial arts in, in an earlier book. Um, but I find it really fascinating that you can you can sit at a table and look at the food that's in front of you and extrapolate from that the story of how it got to your plate. And that involves, you know, emperors attacking places and nomads invading and people developing new foods and poisoning each other. Um, or, you know, there are so many stories contained in the food that reaches our table. And I've decided to tell the Chinese stories behind it all. I mean, I've, I've mentioned a few of them today, so you can see kind of how the story of China is kind of interwoven into, into the food that they eat, but also the food that we eat. Uh, Jonathan, this has been, oh, this has been so great. I wish we could uh, record for the next, uh, next few hours. Cause I could talk Chinese food now. I'm, so <laughs> I'm so hungry now, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Join us tomorrow morning when Matt Bone will be back with Hedge Hopping. He's talking to Matthew Willis about all things Mustang. And then in the afternoon, we will be talking to the fabulous Kiara Stewart about Irish political activist women in the 19th century. All kinds of different organisations, women trying to give themselves a political voice. It's really interesting stuff, don't we? Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.